There's yeah. not a lot that is really new here, but it, um, I put together some, I tried try to make an inexpensive jig that would do a nice job on threading. And this is looking at the jig directly down from above. And a feature is that by trial and error, I know that it has to have is, uh, this is first of all, a, an eight thread per inch for a couple of reasons. I tried finer threads and the finer in thread you go, the tighter the tolerances are on the threads you chase to make sure they either are, they will engage and not be so tight they can't be turned readily, uh, opened and closed readily. Uh, and so the eight thread per inch works well for that. And it also happens to be ideal for screwing scroll chucks on and such. Um, this is about a seven inch long piece of regular one inch eight threaded rod that in fact John Kelsey gave me. And on the left end, I have epoxied on a, uh, a washer that I subsequently turned to make sure it was true because it's really important that your chuck goes up against a, a, a good stop and doesn't just flop around on the thread because they're a little bit loose. There's also a lot of Teflon tape involved here because you have to tape up the threads at both ends so it has no play. Uh, the Teflon works well to uh, keep it from having any chatter. Oh. And that kind of the, the center upper portion, you see a little red square there. That's a 1 16th inch spacer. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. It, go, it goes between the thread screw you see uh, at the very top and the, uh, the vertical riser that makes the, that makes the threads. There's a picture of the jig installed on my lathe. You can see you can, uh, you can't see the hold down bolt, but it's bolted to the table so it can't go left or right. And then a couple of wing nuts on a, uh, on guides that allow it to travel in and out. I'm gonna make a modification of it that will mount on the banjo post. Uh, but this is what I have for the time being. Here's the business thing there. I bought this from uh, AliExpress. It's a six tooth, 60 degree. It's probably right at one inch diameter at the, at the cutting teeth. Uh, carbide inserts, uh, not inside inserts, they're welded on. And it's, it's key to run your lathe at the highest speed it will run. Uh, mine tops out around 3000 RPM and the faster you're cutting, the smoother the cut. The first couple I tried, I ran down around 1800 RPM and it didn't do nearly a good job. Okay, the, uh, the prepared blank, if you will, whatever your outside diameter is, and you're looking at the male on the left here, you want to cut it down to about uh, I show 15, uh, 0.15 there, 150 thousandths of an inch. That's on the radius. You're going to be cutting it down uh, basically about 0.3 on the diameter. And like with any thread, you want to put relief at the root and the outer edge. You only really have to have about one and a half turns of thread, uh, any more turns of thread, and you're screwing the lid forever to put it on. And the actual threaded form, whether you're doing uh, an in, uh, a centerpiece in a, a larger vessel or something, or just a regular lidded cup, the diameter that you want to turn the male threads to is going to be whatever it's going to be. You, make, you, you turn it, and it measures, whatever it measures out to be for the female, cut it smaller than that by one eighth of an inch. Um, and that's for eight thread per inch uh, thread pattern. That'll give you about a 50% engagement uh, on your threads and it runs free and doesn't, doesn't jam at all. And here's the video of, and I'm running at a lower RPM here. This is right around uh, 
1200 to 1800 RPM. And as you rotate it, the threaded rod as it is increasing. And I'm starting at the root here because you want to always be uh, 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 going in that direction so you're not climbing into the grain and having to spin the thing off and the nail thread is always going to pose you if this is you want to start at the root and work your way out. And I'm cutting about 50% of the, the thread there. It works best to do it in two passes. Is it? Is there a reason you start at the back instead of the front? Uh, mainly that's just because I, I thought if I was good, there, there is no good reason, but it, either way it requires starting at the root. Uh, I thought I'd have the best visibility of depth cut from there, uh, but you can do it from either face. But it doesn't change the requirement that you do it from the root out wherever you put it. It's going to cut in the same direction. It's going to have the same cutting tendency. And here you see a second pass, and I am violating what I just said because we're only cutting off about maybe seven or eight thousandths of an inch now. I also learned there's almost no domestic hardwood that works that takes thread well. This is long made a similar box to Swedish walnut. Uh, it's like Barry, after the sound finishes here, tell us that again. We couldn't hear you over the water. That's better. I want to know about what you learned about wood. Locust, locust is the best. I'm not, I have not tried uh, off the mainstream hardwoods. I have tried holly and uh, in fact, the inserts in this box here are the stripes you could see that was laminations of uh, uh, boxwood. I don't know how an entire boxwood piece would turn. Uh, I I made a threading I made a threading jig also and uh, similar to yours, but I find out that locust cuts really nice. I'll have to, uh, an an another American is species that's prevalent south of the Mason Dixon is dogwood, works yeah. just as nice as boxwood and yeah. was used extensively by uh, yarn mills to make bobbin shuttles because it wouldn't stain thread and it's very durable. But uh, uh, also a good practice would is to use MDF and soak it with water thin super glue. Yeah, well, this one here, I, uh, something I didn't mention was after I did the first pass, I uh, took a brush and cleaned the little residue out and put uh, CA, uh, wiped a coat of CA on the, or brushed a coat of CA on the threads and let it penetrate in and hardened it and then recut. Uh, and that helps a lot. Now the female threads uh, require no help at all. I guess it's because of the cutting geometry with the wood. The female threads uh, are no problem and don't tear out at all. It's only these male threads, and I guess it has to do with the uh, the unsupported crest of the tooth. Barry, is the this is Alan? Is the uh, chuck at r right angles, or is the angle slightly offset? You know, that's something I was thinking about just this morning. It is not offset. Um, and in, in thinking about what we have is an analogy of if you have a table saw and you're making a cut on the wood and if you were trying to slide that wood slightly left or right as you pushed it through the blade, you have either the left or right side of the tooth of the saw blade rubbing against the wood and trying to tear it. And that is an analogy. That's the cutter in here is analogous to a very small saw blade uh, and the helix angle, of course, the smaller your diameter of, of your jaw. If I was cutting like a, an inch and a half inside diameter jar, it would become a lot more problematic because of how the helix angle of the thread uh, 
isn't being compensated for. And so a, a proper jig should be adjustable over maybe a quarter degree to half a degree angle to accommodate so that you're cutting parallel to the thread groove and not right. perpendicular to the axis, if you will. Well, when I made that jig a few years ago, I couldn't get it anywhere near that accurate and I couldn't get the slop out of it. It had more slop than that, which is why I, uh, I abandoned the project. So I'm really interested that you got this so tight. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, when I redo it for mounting on a, on a banjo, I'm gonna make it so it, uh, I gotta figure out if it's, if the correct if the correction should be like uh, left, right, or up, down to compensate, I think it should be since I'm cutting on the center line, the compensation should be so that the, uh, the, the box is tilted down or tilted up uh, hmm. versus tilting it clockwise or counterclockwise. Hmm. But that, that is a great question and something just occurred to me this morning on what, how it could be refined. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Barry, Barry and John, uh, if you wanted to, you could use a, a standard hex nut. But what you could do is drill or cut a slot in it and use a kind of a screw or a threaded uh, bolt to squeeze the nut tight on the threads. Yeah, I've tried that, Ernie. I, I'm sure I, I've done that, Ernie, and uh, it does help. The problem is, uh, as long as you are using hardware like you know Lowe's or Home Depot grade rod and nut, they are uh, there are little burrs and high spots on them, and so you really They're have sloppy. to uh, take the threaded rod and mount it on a, a lathe and run it at low speed with a uh, a file and clean the the teeth up so that it runs smooth. Because when I've tried clamping down on the nut. It was actually a connector nut, which is like about an inch and a half long. When I tried clamping down on it, uh, it, it caused, I'll say, irregular friction. So it, it took out all the slop, but it, it made it so it was hard to turn sometimes and then easy to turn other times. Huh. Yeah. So a, a, a lot of thread cleanup. And by the way, I have a, a much more exotic jig than this for doing the same thing but I couldn't claim it to be inexpensive. It was it is homemade, but it was specialty hardware that I was given by somebody. But it, uh, it has no play. It runs on uh, axial bearings uh, and, uh, and pillow blocks. And it has no play whatsoever and it runs exactly concentric. But there's, if you were to buy the parts that I was given, you're looking at probably about 150 bucks. Here the real cost is that little cutter uh, even from China, I think it was like $18. Uh, the American version like John has by the, a company called Moon, M-O-O-N. Uh, just like this, but it's not carbide. Uh, it has more teeth uh, and it's about 40 bucks. Yeah, that's what I had. And there are refinements that could be made, not so much to the, the jig, but on preparing the blank that you can avoid. If you have, a, if you have beautiful grain configuration, a lot of movement on it, and you cut out, when you lose the half inch for the narrow thread, it's hard to get an exact match when you close the back shut. Uh, even if you get it right back to its original position, there's that half inch missing. But there can be a lot of grain changing going on in there. And so I have uh, done one box with the technique of placing an all epoxy thread uh, on the male end so that the only wood you're losing visibly is about a sixteenth of an inch with a narrow first cutting uh, to to separate the wood from the goat. You can kind of see on the bottom of the image there, these female teeth cut really nice. And this is the same kind of wood. So, so Barry, um, what would happen if you use that tool on your um, spiral jig and use, a, uh, use this um, spiral jig completely horizontally? 
um, like the same cutting angle, but off center with the, and reverse the wood and the, and the tool. Yeah, they are. Um, I guess my only immediate issue when I when I thought of that is that this uh, at least this Chinese tool that I bought, the shaft on it is not an American uh, diameter, it's ten millimeter, yeah. and so oh. it's not three eighths and it's not half inch. And so the collet on a router uh, can't accommodate it. Uh, and so I, I didn't go that route. Uh, and also the using the uh, threading or the spiral jig is too coarse of an action. Uh, when you, you know, it's, a, it's advancing at, uh, at a minimum of probably about a uh, three degree helix or something. And it's just, it would put on like, a, at this diameter right here, it would put on like uh, four threads per inch or three threads per inch, which then you'd have to make multiple multiple passes so that you have a equal tooth and gap separation. But but it but if you put it made it so that your um, spiral jig had a lot tighter um, uh, tighter diameter change, you could do it. Is what you're saying? It's just a matter of making sure the ratio is right. And also the uh, the spiral jig can tolerate a little bit of chatter. Yeah, this, uh, yeah. The, this device here can, I mean, this job here can't tolerate any chatter at all. Uh, yeah. That's another reason why you want to run the highest speed you can. You want to get away from any of the harmonics of the, of the piece you're running. And um, in this case here, I have the lid on a small chuck and I had the base on a, a larger, uh, uh, a heavier, about a six pound chuck. And so the harmonics of the two are different, but if you go up around 3000 RPM, you're pretty much staying away from the chatter zones uh, that are gonna amplify by the natural, the natural frequency of the wood. It doesn't, doesn't a, uh, um, a router go at a lot higher speed? It does, and that, that would be that. That is the argument for, uh, for the router. If you're looking at uh, 22 to 28,000 versus like 3,000. Now, on the plus side here, this thing having eight, <coughs> teeth, this cutter having eight teeth is a nice multiplier for a, a typical router. Only has two in some cases, three. And also, I could not find a router bit that had the uh, the 60 degree cutter it would require a, maybe a tool like Ray Simmons has for his uh, as far as a you know ground on demand kind of thing for a fly cutter to get the right geometry in your cutter. Thank you. I think I should have already shown this one. Yeah. Okay, and then, and then here is a, a second pass. Do you have any trouble re-indexing it for the second pass, or does that work okay? No. It, what's of most importance is do not move the bait. Once you have started, once you're ready to make your very first cut, male or female, do not move the bait. Uh, throughout that truck uh, to, to do a chip fit, I threw it away from the cutter all the way so I can then slide it. Uh, I can slide it out toward my belly to get it free of the cutting head so I can try and screw on the cap or screw on the base and it will always return to the same place. I mean, I, the, the little uh, threaded bolt on the left you look at the center left edge of the picture, you'll see that little red square I was talking about spacing the, uh, the little three eighths uh, threaded rod I have there. And that positions its inward position. Uh, when, you, when you remove that 16th insert, the cutter should be just grazing on the female surface. Not taking anything away, but you can just feel it rub. So that then when you take that little spacer out of the way, um, you are, uh, you're engaging by a 16th of an inch and that's, 
that's the desired uh, depth for this thread form. Very cool. It is very nice. Thanks, Barry. Very, really cool. And I got a. There's the uh, the finished item. And very uh, nice. And can you control how it lines up? Yes, you can. You and you have to trim it to do that, don't you? Right after when I, and in fact, I, I screwed up here on it. You know, this thing will line up. And I thought, oh, this is great. With this pattern, I can line it up 180 degrees out. The problem is the wood has enough variation that when I got it lined up, I'm, I'm lined up out by 180. You see how the butt base is lighter than the top. Oh, yeah. And if I, if I rotate it around 180, I'm, I thought about making a little uh, 16th of an inch, like a black shim uh, so that when it's screwed well, down tight, it uh, it would be in the proper alignment, and that. Uh... Great show, Barry. Really good, Barry. Thanks. That was really a terrific show, Barry. Uh, if you uh, ever want to exactly uh, calculate the pitch angle, somewhere I have the formula, but it's uh, it's, it's calculated at one half the thread height. So it would be right. Yeah. That's exactly well. Actually, in this case, it's a little bit less just because of the. Uh, I didn't want to get to any kind of sharp crown on the tooth, uh, so I'm using uh, the actual thread height. Theoretical from a valley to a crest is uh, like you know for it's about 0.866. You know, it's the the sine of 60 degrees times the uh, times the uh, the base, and uh, so a sixteenth of an inch comes out to be about a fifty percent engagement. I'm running maybe slightly more than that in engagement, but here's the here's the box. And if I had, yeah, that's well, that's that's the nice alignment too. It doesn't have to fit tight. That looks great. That looks really good. It's nice to have that reveal around there to separate visually separate the top from the bottom. Very you nice. Could, you could glue a little dab it in there and stop it at that point. Yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking about taking some kind of a either black epoxy or black wood and uh, making a little, I'm sorry, and making a little uh, spacer in there that would stand out maybe a 16th of an inch crowd so that it would, uh, it would close above it. I think and, it's better that way than close tight. It take, yeah. yeah, it takes about, um, I have like one and a half turns of thread here. Uh, so that's. Very, very nice. Very nice work, Barry. Thank you. Nice show too, Barry, thanks. thanks. Ray's got his hand up, go for it, Ray. Hey, Barry, this is, I, this is a box with a, a double lead. This is a double lead eight, which is 16 threads per inch. Uh -huh. I mean, it's hard to see that. If these right? are cut, um, you don't you don't need an offset with that. But you got to be you got to be square um, with your cutter to your piece. So there's no there's no compensation. Otherwise, when you make the cut, you're going to put the threads on. It won't thread right. And a sharp sixty degree cutter. You can I have them down to three sixteenth of an inch, sixty degree cutter. So you can go down real small. So actually the size of the cutter you, and you hit on it is the speed is really important because it makes a nice clean cut um, for how far how fast you advance that um, but uh, what you have to do is and and you you got into the math of it is cut one piece and that's your final piece and that's going to be about 70 percent of a sharp point uh, and you if you get into the books you know what that is and then cut the other one to that and not and use the formula and you'll find that when you take your second cleanup cut on your second piece every piece you make uh comes out the same that if that makes sense because it's very hard to say okay i'm going to do this and take take uh you know this much off because the diameter changes the thread 
the way it fits. So uh, if I have a formula for that, if you need that out of uh, Machinery's Handbook, yeah. and it's it gets gets complicated when you get into the threading. You know that if you're doing any any metal work. Uh, I have Machinery's Handbook, and that is a uh, well that used to be a step off point. Oh. You can find all that information on there. Uh, and I think everything has to be loosened up a little bit for the, I mean, the, the intimacy of the fit has to be loosened up a little bit. And I tried to take a lot of references from a mason jar. Yeah. Uh, Wood ain't plastic is the main thing. Wood ain't metal. It has motion, it moves around, it's not the same. So yeah, but, you can't do it what, to the same tolerances as you would metal or plastic. Yeah, but what happens with a, with a, a thread like a mason jar, there's a thread missing. Yeah. And that's made so you can get it off fast. So when you use an eight thread, like I use a double lead, so it starts in two places. Well, that's actually 16 threads. It's cut as 16 threads per inch, but it's an eight thread cut. Yeah. So you, cut you cut eight threads twice. So it changes the depth of your of your threads. So, but when you go to use a do a mason jar, what happens is the bottom, that big gap in there, the bottom, when you put that in wood or metal the cutter doesn't have a point. So you end up cutting, you cutting the space out for a fast release of the lid. It's really nice when you take something and you do a quarter turn and the lid comes off. So it's like apples and oranges. Yeah. <laughs> Mason jars are also a knuckle thread. So that's, you'd have to drive, grind the cutter to a radius. I'm going to uh, move it along now. I think this is a great discussion and I'm going to separate it out as a separate discussion in the recording from the hour. 